Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Navy League's annual Sea Air Space Conference and Trade Show uh, outside Washington, D.C. in National Harbor. And it is my honor to talk to my friend uh, Bob Papp, uh, retired uh, Coast Guard Commandant of the United States Coast Guard, Admiral One Each, who is now the uh, President for Washington Operations over at the Eastern uh, Shipbuilding Group. Sir, thanks very much for the time. Oh, Vago, it's great to see you again. I've really missed doing interviews with you annually, so uh, it's, uh, it's neat to meet up again and uh, talk about something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, ab absolutely. It's, it was always a treat, and uh, I want to make sure that we continue the tradition. So you're welcome back, not just on an annual basis, but whenever you guys have some news uh, to talk about. And, uh, you know, in many respects, if you were a Coast Guard Commandant, you have a dream job because you continue to be engaged in really one of the most important or the most important uh, capitalization program that the Coast Guard now has uh, ongoing. Obviously, that was a process, you know, a vision that started some two decades ago to go to the, uh, the national security cutters, which would replace the Hamilton class. Uh, and then, obviously, the, off, uh, the fast response cutters, uh, on the lower end of this, the, the scale, and so that program is well underway at this point. Very hard fought competition there for the offshore patrol cutter, which is that mid range to replace the, the 210, the Reliant class, but also the 270s, uh, the Bear class, with, with this new vessel that's 370 feet. First, for our audience, you know, walk through strategically, you know, you know, what was the thinking? Why do you need the high end cutters, the fast response cutters, and where this ship fits into that four structure mix? Well, the high-end cutters, which is the national security cutter, of course, as you said, are replacing the Hamilton-class cutters. Those are the ships that we specifically designed to be capable of operating with the Navy, carrying out uh, military missions, naval warfare missions, as well as the traditional Coast Guard missions. But they obviously have to have a lot more capability and uh, very long legs. Uh, they've got to cross the Pacific, uh, a big theater out there, and up to Alaska. Uh, at the lower end, we need the patrol boats, the fast response cutters, to uh, patrol along the coast and uh, in uh, more sheltered areas uh, to carry out traditional Coast Guard missions and also to support uh, operations with the Navy when they need patrol boats. But the day-to-day -day workhorse of the Coast Guard is the medium endurance cutter, the 210-foot uh, 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 Reliance class, uh, the 270-foot uh, the Bear class. The 210s are getting about 50 years of age right now, really 50s and 60s technology. Uh, they've, they've served the Coast Guard well, but they, uh, they are just not as capable as we need them to be and they need replacement. So th the new offshore patrol cutter, not only is it going to be much more capable than the ships that it's replacing, it's going to be the workhorse. There's going to be 25 of them uh, to be in all those many places where we just don't have enough national security cutters to go around. Uh, and, and let's talk a little bit, and I'm sorry I made that, I called it Reliance. It is Reliance class, so I apologize for that. But talk to us, you know, both the 210s and the 270s, uh, you know, anybody who's ever ridden on them knows they are not the best seakeeping ships. You know, you and I were talking and joking a little bit about it. A 210 rides perfectly well in New York Harbor, but tends to get a little bit uh, rocky and rolly once you get her out to sea. They're also relatively slow ships. Uh, the, the 270s were compromised in design as a budget-saving feature. What are some of the, you know, why are Coast Guardsmen and Coast Guard commanders going to be happy with this ship when it hits the fleet? First of all, this ship is going to have much longer legs than the ships that it replace. And for those that uh, don't understand what long, it means it can travel uh, a long distance. Uh, not only will it be able to get there quicker, uh, but we're also making this economical. Uh, this ship, you can actually shut down the propulsion plant and run the shafts on electric motors coming off the ship service uh, generators. Uh, we think we'll get at least nine knots, maybe 13 knots, uh, depending on how we configure it. So saves fuel, uh, gives you greater loitering time. Uh, the ship is substantial. It's going to ride well in a seaway, uh, which is something, you know, I commanded a, a 270 foot cutter, the forward, and I love that ship, but uh, you really had to pick your weather. And there are some times where you just had to bat down the hatches and wait for the weather to pass over before you could conduct operations. This ship's going to be able to operate in a much broader range of weather conditions, sea conditions, et cetera. And uh, it, it not only will make the crew more comfortable, but when you're comfortable, you can perform your job. It also brings a lot of new technology, improved technology. Uh, it's replacing ships that really utilized 60s technology, and we're going to bring it up to date here in this particular ship. Well, um, so in terms of attributes, you're looking at a 4,000 ton ship. So as you said, it is a pretty substantial vessel. Talk to us about the speed, the range, um, and also the crew size, because obviously each one of the military services, and, and including the Coast Guard, has been working to try to reduce crew size in as prudent a fashion, given that you know you guys also operate 
you know, very distant for long periods of time, and so you guys have actually pretty substantial self-repair capabilities as well. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about all of those dynamics. Well, it's, it's going to be very efficient, and that's one of the things about this ship that makes it attractive to the Coast Guard. Uh, Eastern Shipbuilding Group has come up with a great price. Uh, when I was commandant, whenever any of the companies would come to me and ask me about this particular ship, I, I said, all you need to know is affordability, 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 because we were fighting some significant headwinds in terms of the administration and the Congress at the time in terms of shipbuilding. Uh, so uh, this is a very affordable ship. Its life cycle costs are going to be much lower because we have a, a very efficient crew, 126 people on board uh, for a 360-foot ship. Uh, that's uh, uh, a relatively small crew. And uh, it's going to be capable of going out for 60 days at a time uh, without refueling, uh, resupplying, uh, sufficient uh, supplies on board, uh, can carry up to two helicopters, three boats for the boat crews. Uh, just a full range of enhanced capabilities which will serve the Coast Guard well. Talk to us a little bit about what the schedule of these ships are, when, you know, where you are on construction, where it's going to be delivery, how long it's going to stretch out. Um, give us sort of a snapshot on where you guys are on the program now. Sure. Well, uh, Eastern Shipbuilding Group was awarded the contract just this past year. That was at the end of about uh, four years of competition that started out with literally about a dozen ship uh, builders uh, submitting designs. It was down selected to three just after I retired from the Coast Guard. And then this past year, uh, Eastern Shipbuilding uh, won the award of the contract. The initial contract is for about two and a half billion dollars uh, to construct nine ships with an option for two more and then the contract will be recompeted. So right now we're in uh, detailed design of the ship. Uh, it's a two-year detailed design. We're about six months into that. Uh, we'll be cutting steel in 2018 and then delivering the first ship in uh, 2001, uh, the second ship in 2000, uh, I'm sorry, 2021, uh, 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 second ship in 2022, and then two a year after that until we complete this contract. And then, as I said, we're hopeful that we'll recompete, uh, win the award for the remaining ships, and build at least 25 ships. And, uh, you know, who knows, maybe more, because they are replacing uh, roughly 33 medium endurance cutters that the Coast Guard once had. And what's the speed of the ship? So the top speed on main propulsion is 22 knots. And as I mentioned earlier, it's going to have a hybrid system, which allows you to shut down the main diesel engines, uh, you have uh, ship's generators that are running for ship's power. You can run electric motors on the shafts and get, as we now, right now we know, at least nine knots, which is a good loitering speed for the Coast Guard, and potentially up to 13 knots just on ship service generators alone, which will extend your, uh, your fuel consumption and, and allow you to stay out on station longer. And anybody who's got a birthing space anywhere near that engineering plant is, is thankful that the mains are not running. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Um, let me let me take you to um, you know the international market for ships like this. You guys are in a sweet spot, but it is a very very competitive space out there worldwide. What are you know? Do you guys see the prospects for some international orders of this ship and this design? And if so, where? I do, and here's why. Uh, I would not put my name associated with a company. I mean, it, it, my name uh, as a former commandant of the Coast Guard is very important to me. Uh, but I went down and visited Eastern Shipbuilding Group. It's a family-owned business. Uh, Mr. Discernia, uh, the, the owner and founder, has been in this business for about 40 years. He has six sons that work in the company. They turn all their profits into making the company better. And I've been down to see their products. And it's not just me. I've brought other people down there, people who are shipbuilders. And they are phenomenally impressed by the quality of the workmanship in this yard. Everybody thinks that the United States shipbuilding industry can't compete internationally. This company just built six offshore supply vessels for Brazil. Brazil came to the United States to have their ships built because of the quality and the price. And that's why they won the award for the Coast Guard. So it's a very affordable ship. And I think that uh, given the capabilities of the ship, the size, it's, uh, it's going to be a... Uh, uh, a optimal vessel for Coast Guards and maybe even small navies around the world. So I think there's great hopes for international sales for this. 
Um, I know price point is always dicey because it, may, it, it depends on volume, but what sort of price point are you looking at for each one of these hulls when it's all said and done with? What's sort of the ballpark range? Well, the uh, the ballpark range, uh, and you know, I don't know where I'm getting into proprietary information here, but when we were when I was still in the Coast Guard, as we were budgeting out into the out years, we were looking at a ship that would be somewhere south of 350 million dollars per copy, and uh, we are south of that <laughs> with, with this contract. Let me let me take you um, now. Now put your um, you know your your successor um, you know has has picked up the reins you know is is moving forward and he has talked about a force imbalance and that's a message that you also talked about a, a little bit. There was some optimism and some enthusiasm that there was going to be a significant uptick. Sadly, the Coast Guard has has again sustained you know has become targeted for cuts. Uh, unfortunately, I've editorialized why that that's a bad idea and 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 if anything, folks should be eyeing an increase in the size of the Coast Guard, given the nation's vast maritime spaces that require uh, patrolling. But also, if you increase border defenses, folks are either going to go under that fence, over that fence, or, and, and as you used yeah. to say, uh, or Coast Guardsmen are always happy to point out, that folks go by water in order to be able to enter the United States. In terms of the budgetary dynamics, you know, how do you, how do you see this playing out, you know, over the next couple of years, you know, are you are you confident that those resources are going to be there, or are we, as some people already suspect, going to be in this, you know, maybe a slight bit of uptick, but still a challenging budgetary environment for a lot of political reasons, you know, if you include the Freedom Caucus and other guys, you know, who are going to be looking at, at deficit reduction, which is what got us the Budget Control Act in the first place. Yeah. Well, I think uh, we got off to a bad start in this administration simply because I think uh, the president uh, was was sworn in, and all of a sudden they've got to take another round turn on the 2017 budget and the 2018 budget being introduced to Congress. And OMB, this is Pap's opinion, uh, OMB, uh, with an absence of uh, direct supervision, uh, made some mistakes in terms of uh, what they did with the pass back on the Coast Guard's budget. Uh, generally, that doesn't get publicized. I mean, I had to deal with something like that every year as Commandant, where we got a terrible pass back from OMB, and it would be an uphill battle for us. Uh, fortunately, uh, Secretary Jay Johnson in particular was very supportive during my last year and helped us out. Uh, there's nobody that understands the need for Coast Guard cutters better than General John Kelly. And uh, uh, the Coast Guard is fortunate to have him as the Secretary. He's gone to bat. Uh, the Coast Guard's budget has been restored and I think plussed up a little bit. And Congress has looked very favorably at the Coast Guard over the last couple of years. Uh, uh, they've uh, gotten an additional national security cutter, and who knows where that'll end up. And the offshore patrol cutter is extremely popular, not only within the administration, but within the Congress as well because of that affordability issue. So uh, I'm, am I confident? Well, I'm optimistic. And optimism usually leads to confidence, and uh, you know, we're certainly one of the reasons I took this job is because I think I can still advocate for the Coast Guard while also trying to help uh, what I see as a, a very good family-owned business that's going to uh, help the Coast Guard as well. Let me ask you a quick size question. Um, you know, under your watch uh, and, and preceding watches, you know, the, the Coast Guard has been suffering from chronic budget pressures which have put each one of these acquisition trajectories right. There were those who would tell you that there were eight national security cutters instead of 12, for example, to be a one-on-one -on -one replacement for Hamilton because of some budget challenges. That the number of offshore patrol cutters was reduced to 25 from a higher number, just like the fast response cutters were reduced. Do you think ultimately that the Coast Guard does actually need a significantly larger force to hit to that larger number? Or, or is that current number actually pretty good to have a balanced long-term force? Uh, no, the, the Coast Guard clearly needs more people. Uh, they are overextended right now. Uh, I think they are down by about 5,000 people from where I was at, at the top uh, during my time as Commandant. And that's simply because the budget has not grown, uh, particularly under the Budget Control Act. And when you're trying to make decisions about future capabilities, basically acquisition and construction, Sometimes you have to trade off your operations uh, budget. And when you look at the cumulative effect of that over three or four years, most of the time the only way you can get savings is by reducing people if you want to try to build for the future. Uh, Coast Guard's been through those cycles before and survived it. Uh, I, I, I think that the cycle will come around again. As I said, I'm optimistic under this administration that shipbuilding is going to get attention, national security is going to get attention. Uh, we just have to keep the pressure on and keep reminding people that uh, the Coast Guard is that additional armed service out there. 
and let me ask you one last question. Um, everybody has a tendency of forgetting the importance of the Coast Guard in the inland buoy tender fleet. Uh, enormously important. Obviously, you know, as a boater, it, it was always amazing to me how those buoys, you know, were. You had the winter buoys all set up, and it was quick, clean, and you know, uh, you know, you you wouldn't find like a massive Coast Guard presence somewhere. Everybody was doing a very, very hard, very dirty, very tough job with methodical precision. If you consider the aids to navigation, both the float and the shore, those are all Coast Guard requirements, and that's what these. And oh, by the way, the ships also serve as an important disaster relief, um, oil spill, environmental, you name it. How important is that recapitalization program? Um, you know, and, and are you optimistic that folks recognize that? Because these ships are big and sexy. Those inland black hulls are significantly less sexy for a lot of people. Do you think that's going to get the attention that it deserves? And how important are those ships? Well, well Vago, I used to find them pretty sexy. I mean, <laughs> I spent my uh, almost the first uh, quarter of my career in what we call the Black Fleet. Uh, and that's really all I ever wanted to do, work in AIDS navigation. I was a buoy tender, a sailor. Uh, so that's always been near and dear to my heart. I, I got a chance during the uh, 90s uh, as Chief of Congressional Affairs to help on the rebuilding project for all our seagoing buoy tender fleet, which most people thought would never get done. But uh, we built, uh, uh, I guess it was roughly 30 uh, seagoing buoy tenders, large and small, uh, during that time period. Uh, now's the time to start looking at that inland fleet. And, and you're right, some of them are, are approaching 70 years of age. Uh, we've been somewhat fortunate because we've got good people out there maintaining them. And, uh, and also the benefit of being in, in fresh water instead of salt, which uh, you can't discount that. But uh, clearly the technology has been, I mean, I think sometimes they ha the engineers have to go out on eBay to find parts to re uh, repair some of the equipment that they have. So uh, I'm encouraged that uh, Admiral Zunkov, the current commandant, is now turning his attention to that, trying to make that a program, a record, and, uh, and I'll be anxiously and, and, and with great interest following that project here. And, and how important are those ships? You know, there is a tendency of overlooking them, hence why we have ships with wooden deck houses, for example, that are more than 70 years old now. You know, how important are those ships? I mean, what's the message to deliver to those lawmakers who might not think of those as critical to the nation's economic lifelines as they actually are? Well, you know, we have, uh, and, and I'm, I apologize for forgetting the exact figures, but we have thousands and thousands of uh, w miles of inland waters which serve as highways. Uh, you, you don't have the truck traffic and everything else on our on our uh, uh, terrestrial, our land-based highways, because we're able to put things on ships. Uh, the prosperity of our country re uh, relies upon uh, safe transit on those inland waterways. All the tributaries of the Mississippi, et cetera, that uh, br bring cargo, grain, oil, coal uh, to the uh, international market, and. Uh, those ships have to travel safely. So those aids to navigation, the buoys, the markers, the other things that those, I think it's about 30 ships cover the entire United States. I think if we only had 30 repair trucks for uh, the interstate highway system, uh, somebody would be saying, you got to build more and, and they can't be 70 years old. So uh, these ships are absolutely vital to the safe and secure transit of all those materials on our rivers. And will we see Eastern playing in that market as well? Well, I, I, I think certainly uh, Eastern would be interested in that. Uh, that's, that's where they grew up, is in small ship construction, tugs, uh, oil supply vessels, et cetera. Uh, I think Eastern would be a, uh, a, a good competitor for that uh, program of record. Admiral Papp, it's always an honor and a treat talking to you, and look forward to visiting the shipyard. All right, Vago, thank you for interviewing us.